Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, the bitch you channel where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I've got your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like the video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch stores on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. As my longtime viewers know, I'm a libertarian. I wouldn't vote for neither a Democrat nor a Republican if you held a gun to my head. And in most presidential administrations, this makes me a critic of the current president, no matter who it is or what a party they may be affiliated with. When a Republican is in office, Republicans think that I'm a Democrat. When Democrats are in office, the Democrats think I'm a Republican. Neither seems to be able to, you know, cope with the notion that there may be more than two sides to a single issue. Modern leftists, they might be more comfortable if I identified myself as politically non-binary. In the Trump administration, I have more frequently found myself defending Trump. And this isn't because I agree with his policies. In fact, I have numerous very fundamental disagreements with many of them, just as all libertarians do. However, this time around, the American left has simply lost its capacity for rational thought. The right tends to think of this as Trump derangement syndrome, and uh, I kind of hesitate to use that because what it actually is, it's a result of a very successful propagandist leftist press that has been on a jihad to destroy Trump since the moment he was elected. Now, all the things that you have heard about Trump being a racist, sexist, homophobic Nazi are untrue. Tarring anyone who voted for him as the same is really disingenuous. You have been paying attention to a propagandist press. Always remember, as it scrolls past on my lower third in every single episode, nothing you see in the press is real. Nothing. You may look, in fact, at several videos that I have in which I debunk press articles for proof of this. And in point of fact, I am in position where I really should do another debunking, and I would prefer to do this as same way as I did the last time, which is as a viewer challenge. So I would throw this out to my viewers. Find me any print story that's accessible from the web. It needs to be print just because it makes it easier for me. I can't do editing very well, so pointing out the slick interfaces and stuff and what they're doing at TV would be harder. So if it's print, I can put it up here behind me and you know have some visual aids. So it needs to be print. It needs to be accessible from the web. Now, I will not look at this story in advance. I will do it completely cold. I won't script anything. I will just turn on my cam, and I will start recording, and we'll go through and debunk it. So please feel free to drop the, any URL to any news story whatsoever, doesn't matter where it's from, in the comments, and I will pick it up and use it next time around on my show. And on that topic, just sort of briefly about a Project Veritas story that dropped today. And there's a link to that story below. It's the, the BitChute URL because, well, people tend to have uh, Project Veritas's uh, videos deleted on the YouTube side, and that doesn't happen on BitChute. Bitch shoot for the win. It's why this show is a bitch shoot channel. I don't have to worry about getting taken down. But it seems that about three years ago, ABC reporter Amy Robach got the goods on Jeffrey Epstein, the pedophile who globe trots and apparently gets some very high up muckety mucks involved in raping young girls. She had the goods on him, and this was three years ago, and for various reasons, the story was spiked. Now, Project Veritas got a recording of Roback discussing the story with her producer on a hot mic. So if you don't know, reporters really just sit in a small studio behind a green screen. I mean, I've got about 10 feet square that I'm using here. That's about what they have. It's a small studio with a green screen behind them, like I have, a teleprompter in front of them. I have a makeshift one. And they have an earpiece in their ear, which they can use to, their director and producer can communicate with them. And their mic is clipped to their lapel. And when they're not, they're not live, for example, if they're waiting to be thrown to a segment or during a commercial, then the microphone is still microphone and camera. They're still active because it's more trouble to turn it all off and then start it all up again than it is just let it run. So people in front of the camera will sometimes just chew the fat with the director or producer in their ear, or maybe they'll talk to the director or producer or someone on the floor in front of them. Again, it's a small studio, just a green screen. And in this case, Amy Robach got to chewing the fat with her producer about the Epstein story and how she had all the details three years ago and how NBC higher-ups kept spiking the story. And she keeps talking about how she's getting pissed and more pissed every single day. 
Now, while the spiking of the story is the scandalous thing and indicative of how nothing you see in the press is real, nothing, I do want you to listen to Amy Robach carefully. Why is she pissed off? She's actually fairly clear about it, at least to me. It doesn't have anything to do with getting a global pedophile off the streets, and it has nothing to do with protecting this pedophile's victims. Amy Robach is actually pissed off because she didn't get her scoop. I worked with journalists since I was 15 years old. From the Lincoln Journal Star to the Chicago Sun-Times, from KOLN-TV in Lincoln, Nebraska to CNN, they've all been exactly the same. They don't care about the facts. They care about getting as close to the front page as possible or how long their segment's going to be so their name is in the limelight. Amy Robach is pissed off here because she didn't get her scoop. Journalists have been this way always. And for proof of this, I always like to point people to the 1931 version of the film, The Front Page. And I have a link to that in my description box as well. Now, while this is a dark satire, it was written by a pair of then-contemporary Chicago journalists, and much of the behavior of the reporters was drawn from their own personal experience as reporters. So take that film and update it for modern technology, and ask yourself this question. Has anything changed? And I think you'll find, looking at it, that the answer is a big resounding no. Nothing you see in the press is real. Nothing. By the way, as an aside on this, if you watch the front page, and please do, it's a great movie, Keep an eye out for the character of Schwartz. You see, the front page was originally a 1929 Broadway play, and as many of my longtime viewers know, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor, and I uh, was once in a stage production of the front page where I played Schwartz. But I digress. In any case, I have found myself defending Trump more frequently than objecting to his policy because the left has lost their capacity for rational thought. And this means that my viewership has slid so that I have a lot of Republicans and people on the right who are watching me, and I've tried not to let this really impact the content of my videos. But the fact is that much of what I've done about Trump has largely been driven by the left's complete insanity. Now, this video is going to the Democrats, and it's quite serious and hopefully helpful for you. It's one you do need to hear if you even want a snowball's chance in hell of defeating Trump in 2020. It's also your last chance before you start a civil war in 2020 when Trump wins, which we all know is on your minds. Democrats, your only contender against Trump in 2020 is Tulsi Gabbard. Unlike every other one of your nominees, Tulsi Gabbard isn't a lunatic communist slash socialist. You guys need to get this through your heads now and because it will always be the case in the U.S. The overwhelming majority of people in the United States abhor socialism and communism. They abhor it for a damned good reason. Communism and socialism always fail, killing millions in the process. The entire 20th century is nothing but a history textbook of failed communist and socialist governments. In modern times, you only need to look at Venezuela to see how socialism has destroyed that country. Within the U.S., Just look at how it destroyed the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, which is consistently rated above every other slum in every city, every ghetto, the number one slum in America. And if you dare open your eyes long enough, look at how socialism has destroyed California. Socialists can't even do appropriate forest management, which is causing some of the massive fires that we see. And look how socialism has destroyed Illinois. That state, because of Chicago, is now in a neck-and-neck race with California to see who can go bankrupt first. Communism and socialism always fail, killing millions in the process. Americans will never vote for a communist nor a socialist for president. Now, Kelsey Gabbard is not communist nor socialist. She's certainly left-leaning, but far more centrist. She has far more in common with Bill Clinton or Jimmy Carter. Gabbard is a Hawaiian a practicing Hindu, and the first Samoan American member of the Congress. Now, in 2002, Gabbard was elected to the Hawaii House of Representatives. And in 2004, she became the first state legislator to voluntarily step down from public office for a tour of duty in a war zone. Gabbard uh, served in the, a field medical unit of the Hawaii Arm, Army National Guard in a combat zone in Iraq, from 2004 to 2005, and then was deployed to Kuwait from 2008 to 2009. 
she left a position in government in which she could probably have used connections to get out of going to combat. How many people in the U.S. House of Representatives, Senate, anywhere, how many of them gave up a seat to go fight? Oh, sure, they were voting to send people's sons and daughters to fight. But did they get up and fight themselves? Not a single damn one of them. You know, I taught IT for three years at a place that I usually call the place that shall not be named. And I had a lot of veteran students. And a lot of these people were serving at the same time she was, similar ages. And they went because after 9-11, they said, oh, okay, I hear the country's call. What do, you, what, what do you think about it or not? That's what they heard, their country's call. And they went out and they signed up the next fracking day. They were down at the, the uh, office trying to get into the Army the next day. It's a big deal here. It's a bigger deal than it sounds to veterans particularly. Tulsi Gabbard did not use her connections to get out of being deployed. She went and got deployed and she quit. Who in the House, who in the Senate around 9-11 did that? Anybody? Crickets. And as a consequence, now here she was, um, she was a vice chair of the Democratic National Committee from 2013 to 2016, but get this, she resigned that position to endorse Bernie Sanders in 2016. And don't really appreciate the endorsement, they appreciate the fact that she had, she was upstanding enough to quit Gabbard is now the first female combat veteran to ever run for president. Gabbard is then on October 25th of this year, she announced that she will not seek another term in the Congress. So that means if she doesn't win the presidency, her political career is probably about over. Now, I'm not gonna get into her political platform pranks, uh, planks very much because, you know, to be honest, she's way too left for my taste, particularly concerning the Second, Fourth, and Tenth Amendments. And should she win the Democratic nomination, I'll have plenty about that to say about that in the future, so I'm not going to talk about that here. However, she is not a raging, crazed communist slash socialist, and that alone should make her the only person that a Democrat should nominate. <laughs> because let's be clear, I don't think any Democrat can win against Trump in order for that to happen, the economy would really have to sink in the next year or so. And to paraphrase Democratic shill James Carville, it's about the economy, stupid. It always is. It's always about the economy. If the economy is doing fine, nobody cares. So can Gabbard win, win against Trump? No, no, she can't. However, unlike the others, she's an actual contender. She stands some chance of actually making the race a little bit close. Now, because of who she is, Gabbard is near immune from Trump's usual campaign smears. He can't call her crooked. I mean, not only is there no evidence of this, but she was also recently attacked by Hillary Clinton, who called her a Russian asset. Oh, God, I love that. Gabbard responded to Clinton appropriately, using her, uh, calling her the epitome of the rot and corruption in the Democratic Party. I'm not going to vote for Gabbard, but damn. The Clintons dominated Democratic politics for most of my adult life. For 30 years, Bill and Hillary skated from one illegal scandal to the next, and the only reason that they weren't put in jail and aren't there now is because they know where too many people's bodies are buried. To finally see Hillary Clinton called out as the corrupt skank that she is, and by a Democrat, oh, that immediately made me like Gabbard. Would that some of the rest of the losers running for the Democratic nomination would have the courage to stand up to Hillary? That they don't should probably tell you volumes about how corrupt they themselves are. Now, Trump can't call Gabbard stupid, nor any variation thereof. If you've watched Gabbard for any length of time, she's clearly an intelligent and well-spoken individual. In fact, on a debate stage, this would stand in really stark contrast to Trump. Even if you're a supporter, I think you have to admit that he largely relies on basically optics and sound bites in his campaigns. And Trump can't possibly attack Gabbard's patriotism. She is a com decorated combat veteran holding the rank of major in the Hawaii uh, Army, Army and National Guard. And again, this is a big deal. You know, I, I, all of those veterans that I used to teach, they often opined that their distaste for someone who's never seen combat being commander-in-chief of the U.S. Armed Forces. And this included Trump, though 
when you're faced with the choice of Trump or Clinton, like many Republicans, they just held their nose. Now, Gabbard can and would run circles around Trump with regard to military matters. Trump knows more about the military than she does, only in his own mind. Now, Trump can't possibly impugn Gabbard's race. She is legitimately Samoan American, unlike the claims made by some other Democratic nominees that I might mention. Furthermore, any kind of statement that Trump might make about race that wasn't 100% pure sounding could be used against him by Gabbard. And similarly, Trump can't impute Gabbard's religion nor anyone else's. As a practicing Hindu, she can throw anything that he might even remotely sound bad against someone's religion back in his face. And the propagandist press, of course, will be thrilled to help Gabbard's out. Trump can't attack Gabbard's age. She's only 38 and he's 73. In fact, she has it all over him physically. Several images in this uh, slideshow, the majority of them, in fact, uh, are what prompted me to make this video in the first place. Trump is an overweight 73-year-old man who is fantastically narcissistic. Being narcissistic isn't unusual in a president, but Trump is really overflowing with it. I think you can easily make the claim that he suffers from narcissistic personality disorder. Gabbard, on the other hand, is clearly a youthful looking 38. She's extremely fit, such uh, that uh, even a non-democrat, lots of non-democrat men will admit to finding her sexually attractive. In fact, unless you're below a certain age, if you're a red-blooded heterosexual male and you don't find Gabbard attractive, you need to get your testosterone level checked. And she is, to my knowledge, the only presidential candidate to ever look good in a swimsuit. Gabbard recently um, posted a video of her doing this workout here that you see on Twitter. Now, Democrats, you need to look at this very video very damn carefully because this, just from an optics perspective, is really fantastic. Because if you watch the video, you could almost hear, you know, the eye of the tiger from Rocky in the background. Um, the video, it, it almost gives the impression like she is training for an MMA match against Trump. And physically, of course, she'd wipe the floor with him in about half a picosecond. These are all really good optics, by the way, and something that Gabbard should continue doing. Tulsi Gabbard is virtually immune from all of Trump's usual tactics. He can't call her names. He can't impugn her patriotism, nor her fitness, nor her intelligence. If he slips up once and says something that could be remotely interpreted as racist by anyone, she can throw it back in his face in spades. Democrats, Tulsi Gabbard is the only candidate who stands the slightest chance of competing against Trump. The rest of the lineup are corrupt, socialist, and communist losers. Trump will mop the floor with all or any of them. Nominating someone else other than Gabbard will ensure a Democratic defeat in 2020. Now, can Gabbard win against Trump? No, no, nobody can. However, Tulsi Gabbard is a contender. In fact, she's the only contender. Democrats, nominate anyone else at your own peril. Tulsi Gabbard is the only contender. And that's all I have to say about that. So I'd love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So thanks for watching. That's all the time we have today for this episode of the highly acclaimed, world-renowned Tales from SYL Ranch, the BitChute channel where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.